Hello and welcome to the Refs Need Love To podcast, a show that gives you a real, raw, and behind-the-scenes view of one of the hardest jobs in the pitch, the referee. I'm your host, David Gerson, a grassroots referee with eight years of experience and over 1,200 matches under my belt. You can find me at refsneedlove2.com and on TikTok and on Insta, I should say. This month, we'll be reviewing the infamous serious human errors that occurred in the Tottenham-Liverpool match. One of the worst phrases I can hear during a pregame talk, and we're going to hit the mailbag. First off, are Premier League refs the best in the world or the worst in the world? Well, I certainly know for a fact they're not the worst in the world. I mean, these are professionals with unbelievable training and unbelievable facilities, and they're under outrageous amounts of pressure and get constant development and assessments. So they are certainly not the worst. I actually think they could be the best. I mean, when you look at what they deal with, the scrutiny they're under, and you compare them to refs in other countries, such as, say, Spain or Germany, I think they are definitely among the best in the world. And you can see in their um, their positions that they're granted or assigned in major international tournaments that they're widely considered to be the best by their peers as well. So let's talk about these three key calls in the Liverpool game that went against Liverpool that everyone is so outrageously upset about. Uh, first off, the Jota two yellows. I mean, they're deserved. If you're coming behind an attacking player and you get so close to them that you wind up clipping their heel as they're running in front of you, we saw it, uh, Di Maria in the World Cup. Okay, it's a foul. And when it, it happens on a promising attack, it's spa. It's stopping a promising attack. And if it's in the penalty area, it's a penalty kick. It's deserved. And then he does that other really silly sliding challenge from behind underneath the back of a player taking him down. It is two yellow card offenses. You know, he should be sent off. Um, the second one that was uh, controversial, and I'll get to the VAR in a second, but the second one was the Curtis Jones serious foul play lunging tackle. I think we all need to recognize that we are at the professional level refereeing in the age of VAR. And so what that means is it's not so much is it a red card on the field? Does it look like it's a red card on the field? It's is it a red card when you look at the video, (laughs) when you look at the playback? And that's the thing. When you go to VAR and you look at what happened, I've got a player leaving their feet coming into the challenge, okay? Studs up catching the opponent high on the ankle above the foot with enough force that it rolls that ankle over with their full weight, okay, that is serious foul play. It's a red card in the age of VAR. I recognize eight years ago before VAR, it might have been a yellow card, but the general public was screaming for consistency, and now you've got some consistency in how people are applying the laws of the game as it relates to Red card challenges, not yellow card challenges, but red card challenges. Therefore, it's serious foul play. I want to throw out a theory. Maybe, maybe the reason why Liverpool is surrounded in so much of this controversy of these calls on a week-to-week basis is because of heavy metal football and the Gagan pressing or high pressing, if you will, and the must win the ball back at all costs mentality that he has instilled in his players. Is it You know, a good thing for him, a good strategy to win a match. Yeah, gets a lot of turnovers, gets the ball, you know, high on the pitch, okay? It's really good for, you know, his strategy to win games. But it also opens that team up to the possibility that they will commit red and yellow card offenses. Think about that. Maybe they're in the midst of all this controversy because of their style of play not because they're being targeted. Now, tell that to a Liverpool fan and and that they'll think you're a Manchester United fan, but I'm just saying it's a possibility. Now, all that to be said, that certainly is not going to make them feel any better about the awful, serious human error. That's a direct quote. <laughs> serious human error that they experienced on the Luis Diaz goal that was ruled off. Okay. Excuse the dogs barking in the background. I'm going to just keep on going for this here. Um, but it, what's really upsetting about this is that the, the VAR and the assistant VAR 
and the referee and the assistant referee and the video assistant review person did everything right on this. Okay, so when the the play is beginning, uh, we've got a referee and the AR communicating about what they're seeing. And as the ball is played through, you have the assistant referee saying, holding, holding, holding. Okay, he's saying that because, because he's holding his flag to see what happens in the play because he thinks he has a potential offside or he thinks he's got an offside call. So the goal is scored. He raises his flag. And then someone says, possible offside DS. That's from the VAR, okay? And the assistant referee says, give it. And the assistant referee says, come back for offside, mate. And the VAR is just checking for offside, delay, delay. And then they go through that process. I'm sure you've seen it, getting the kick point and everything, looking at the angles. And all that to at the very end of this play, this communication from the VAR that simply says, check complete, check complete, that's fine. And completely forgetting, you know, having a complete, you know, mind gone moment that it was given as offside on the field and they needed to award the goal. Now, I'm going to contribute this to two things. Number one, number one, the communication protocol is broken, is definitely broken here. When you say check complete, you should qualify it and say check complete, goal. Goal should be awarded, restart with a kickoff. Or check complete, offside, restart with an indirect free kick for the defending team. That would have cleared that up. That would have been very helpful. That, that could have been very good. The other thing I want to say is that the VAR is sitting in a booth potentially hundreds of miles away. Here in the United States, the VAR facility is here in Atlanta, Georgia, and the game could be happening in Seattle. So you literally have 3,000 miles in between uh, where the VAR is sitting and where the game is happening. And so the VAR is not hearing what's happening in the stadium. They're not able to look out aside from their monitor and see where the AR is sta standing or where the kick is about to be taken from. They're staring in at their monitor, their little, little point on the screen and seeing what's right in front of them for what's most important from that moment in time, as opposed to what's actually happening on the pitch. And so I think if they were actually in the stadium, I'm sure someone would have looked up and be like, oh, wait, they're about to start for the uh, offside. Uh, we need to tell them that it's a goal. Okay. So I'm saying distance and then the communication breakdown. And I would also like to say, I think that um, the need to speed up VAR, which was something that was really important after the first couple of years of VAR, and we didn't want to wait five minutes for a decision, also probably contributed for this breakdown. But it's still a problem and we need to get better on our communications. Um, we are still nascent. I mean, really at the beginnings of VAR technology in the world, you know, people have not been doing this for 10, 20 years. Um, a lot of these AR, VAR officials are doing this, you know, for the first year, for the second year of their lives. And it's very different being in a VAR booth than it is actually on the pitch itself. So I think that is all contributing to the breakdown and I feel really bad for, for Liverpool on this one. I will say, <laughs> and this was kind of funny, the head of PGMOL also said this as well, is that you know before VAR, if we didn't have VAR, it would have been ruled offside anyway because the assistant referee called offside on this play. That is no solace to Liverpool who feels like they missed out on a goal and it could have changed the outcome on the game. So I feel bad for them, but communication is key. Being clear in our communication is key, whether we have comms or not. That is absolutely critical, and that needs to be better from the Premier League going forward. I think they need to make their uh, VAR communications transparent in real time, and that would force them to being much more mechanical and professional in their communications. I will say, I think automated VAR is coming in the very near future for offside. Mm. I said to get a little sip of water there, guys. So much excitement. All right. So, next thing. I had to coach someone through... Their first red card this week. And you're like, coach, what are you? Are you a mentor now? Quite honestly, I am signing up for my mentor course and I do want to be a certified mentor. But every time we are on the pitch together, especially when you're an experienced referee, is you have the opportunity to mentor 
junior referees. And when I say junior referees, referees who are haven't been refing as long, and even your fellow, you know, senior referees, if they're open to feedback, you can give feedback. Well, I was AR1, and we are like 10 minutes into a U14 game. And wouldn't you know, we've got someone through on goal, and they are probably three yards past any other closer defender, and a defender running behind clearly trips the girl over. So we are about, I'd say, five or six yards outside of the penalty area, probably 10 yards to the right of the arc or the D, if you will, but certainly in our goal, in on goal. One or two touches more, probably one touch more, they're in the penalty area, and they have a clear goal-scoring opportunity. So, I mean, I recognize we've got all of our conditions met, (laughs) and so I call uh, the referee over, and I'm, you know, because I, I could see he's not even awarding a yellow card. I, I don't believe in this moment. Maybe he did. I don't. I don't remember him doing a yellow card. But I, I look at him and I go, "Hey, you know," I kind of like, "Come on over here." Like, just give him that little signal. And so he comes on over, and I said to him, "I was like, hey, uh, that's a dog so red card. It's a denial of obvious goal scoring opportunity red card." And you should have seen his face. And he literally says to me directly, "He's like." I don't want to do it. <laughs> I'm like, buddy, it's a teenager. Okay. And I'm like, I understand you don't want to do it, but all of the conditions were met. It is a red card. Now I also had a dog. So literally this past weekend, actually that I had to give. no one likes giving out red cards. Okay. No, no one enjoys receiving a red card. It makes people upset. People get angry, but when the conditions are met, we need to do it. Again, here are the conditions one more time. So three Ds and a C. The first one, distance between the offense and the goal. So normally, but not exclusively, the nearer the goal when the offense occurs, the more likely an obvious goal scoring opportunity was denied. So if it's all the way back in their defensive half of the field, okay, probably not going to give a dog. So that would be spa potentially or stopping a promising attack, but not dog so too much distance to go too many oppor- too much of an opportunity for someone to recover on that one not going to happen i've seen it done at the halfway line when someone was in the center of the field and they were literally going to be away i've seen this in the premier league okay they, where they've awarded a dog so at u14 probably not way too much distance to cover way too much of an opportunity for someone to recover on that one and get between them and the goal so we're never going to award a dog so in the middle of the field for youth academy unless it's like mls next or something like that so distance has to be considered and this was in the attacking third right outside of the penalty area on both situations both mine and this other young gentleman the second thing we consider general direction of play towards the opponent's goal So it doesn't have to be directly at the goal, but if we're right outside the 18 and they play a ball, you know, kind of diagonally left into the penalty area and they get taken down, yeah, that's generally in the direction of the opponent's goal. If they are outside the penalty area at the corner of the penalty area and they take a touch and it takes them towards like to the corner at that point, then I would say that is not towards the opponent's goal, but generally direction towards the opponent's goal, consideration. The third one, and this used to be control of the ball, meaning you had to have control of it. Now it is likelihood of control. So was it played in front of them? Was it within playing distance? Would it be easily controlled? Okay, that is the the measure for likelihood of control. And then last one, location and number of defenders. If there is no more than one defender, okay, and the goalkeeper is classified as a defender present when the offense occurred, Okay, between that ball and the goal, then that generally indicates a goal scoring opportunity was denied. If there's more than one defender present in front of the attacker when the offense occurs, then generally, you know, if they're not going to be able to become part of that goal scoring phase, generally that might be spa. But if there's only one, you know, such as the goalkeeper to beat or one other defender to beat, okay, and the goalkeepers maybe come out of the goal. Okay, in that case, one or none, then we've got denial of obvious goal scoring opportunity. And so we went through the considerations and like he he knew he had to do it, but you could tell he was upset. And I understand that. 
Giving red cards is hard, but that's our job. We are the referee. We are there to enforce the laws. If someone breaks the laws, it's our job to enforce the laws. That's what we do. It is not because we don't like someone and we want to give a red card. It's not because we're biased. It's because we have integrity and we want to uphold the laws of the game that we give that red card. It is hard to score in soccer. It's hard to score in football. Therefore, we need to apply that red card because it denies an obvious goal scoring opportunity. So I I just want to go through that one more time, the considerations, and also just let you know out there, it's okay. If you give a red card, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, it's just like that famous line (laughs) in Wreck'em Ralph is like, I am a, a bad guy, but that does not mean I'm a bad guy. Okay. Just because you're a bad guy in the, in the game doesn't mean you're a bad person. Just because you have to give a red card doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's okay. So just want to throw that out there to you. If it's a red card situation, you need to show the red card regardless Okay, of maybe I don't want to, you need to. It's important to do it. There are tools and we need to enforce the laws of the game. Cool. All right. Next topic. The worst thing that you can say to me pre-game, the worst thing, and I've seen this happen so many times in experience, is the line, yeah, I'm just going to let them play. Okay? That is the worst you can say to me. Okay? When someone says that to me, I know what's about to happen, and I cringe. Now, I try not to show it on my face. I try just to smile and be like, okay. (laughs) But here's what usually happens. This usually says to me, I'm just going to let him play, translates into, I'm not going to call any fouls until the game gets completely out of hand. People start screaming at me, and and then I have no choice but to blow my whistle. Seriously, that's what it says to me. If we do not apply the laws, and we do not blow our whistle and call fouls, we are going to create a vacuum. It's just like when you're standing next to someone and no one's talking, you feel like you need to say something to fill the space. It's the same thing on a soccer pitch. If fouls are occurring and you're not calling those fouls as the referee, guess what? Coaches are going to start to try and fill that vacuum. Players are going to start to fill that vacuum. And spectators are going to want to fill that vacuum. It is our job. We're there with the whistle. We're wearing the jersey. We got the badge. We call the fouls, okay? We're the ones who give cautions for reckless fouls and red cards if it so requires. Now, I recognize it takes courage, knowledge, integrity, and a love for the game to do that. It's not easy, but that's the job we've chosen to do. That's what we've chosen to do is be a referee, and we're there to officiate that game and call fouls if fouls occurs. I think sometimes people feel, well, you know, if I don't call any fouls, then people will like me as a ref. Let me tell you, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. I think people don't call fouls because they think, oh, people are going to like me more. No, people are going to hate you more. (laughs) People are going to be so frustrated that you're not calling fouls and you're not protecting the children. Okay. They're going to get so angry and they're going to hate you. I'm serious. I'm serious. I know it's counterintuitive, but a referee who calls more fouls consistently, like you have an understanding of what their tolerance is, and they call the same foul, call it both ways, you know, over and over again, okay, they will be respected and appreciated. If you call no fouls, people will disrespect you, start dissenting, and you will lose control of the game. And you and I tell you, it just crescendos. When you don't call fouls for legitimate trips, legitimate pushes and things of that nature and pulls, it is just going to build. Oh, well, he didn't call that one. So I'm going to try this. He didn't call that. Well, I'm going to try this. Well, he didn't call that. Well, I'm going to do this. Oh, he did that. To, and the players are like, well, he got away with that. I'm going to do it. And it just builds and builds and builds until the game is completely out of hand. And you can't get it back after that. If you're like, well, then I'm going to start calling fouls. I'm sorry. It's gone. It's over at that point. It is not going to be quality for you. It's not going to be a quality experience for the kids. It's not going to be a quality experience for the coaches or for the players. So please call the fouls. Don't just let them play. This is not 
recreational schoolyard soccer. Okay. Whether it's organized recreational soccer or academy soccer or adult league or whatever, they're paying for a referee for a reason. Be a referee and call the fouls. I recently had a mom come up to me after a match specifically to tell me how much they appreciated me keeping the match under control. And this was a parent from the losing team. Their kid's team was beat 6-1. They lost 6-1. And she came up to me to tell me how much she appreciated me keeping the match under control. Now, this was a Mitch match. And I will tell you, at the lower academy levels, this can really happen. This was a Spanish-speaking team on, the, on one side who were really, really good. And they were obviously at a much higher level, both skill-wise and intensity. Their challenges were more energized. And these kids, you can tell, just grew up with football in their blood. And it meant something to them. And it meant something to their parents. But man, had I not stayed on top of this early, it could have been rough. It could have been rough. But this parent recognized that they got beat fair and square. And it didn't devolve into a brawl. It was a proper game of soccer that everyone could enjoy. Win or lose, it was well-managed, and she appreciates that. She appreciates that. So remember that. When someone says, or you've been thinking, maybe I'm just going to let him play, okay? It is not going to help. When you hear a parent scream, let them play, it is the exact same parent who's going to scream, protect the children, when the foul it is like someone's on their team is getting foul. Set your bar for foul early's early. Be consistent throughout. Thinking you can dial it back later in the match after it's already gotten out of hand is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster. I had to run a, a, a U18 center without an AR on an AR on a full size turf pitch. I covered almost six miles in just one match. And I had done a U15 center right before that. It's no easy task, but man, you know, staying proactive with my foul calls and recognition, you know, really helped keeping that match under control as well. Um, I I just want to say also to, I met this wonderful, wonderful coach for that U18 game. I mean, and it was a wonderful match. Like, fantastic. The kids were respectful, played to the whistle. Um, everyone, I, I believe, played, you know, to the best of their abilities, whatnot. We didn't see any, like, um, type of aggression after fouls were called or anything like that. It was wonderful, um, both from the home club and the visiting club. And it, before the match, I was able to have this wonderful conversation with the visiting team coach. And let me just say real quick, a, a, just a brief interjection. You must Build rapport with coaches pre-match and players pre-match. The last thing you want to do is have your first conversation with a coach be a conversation about dissent or a hard foul when people are upset. And I see this all too often, especially my junior referees. Like they'll go to the check-ins and they'll barely say anything to anyone. They'll just like check off names, like have a little bit of dialogue, a little bit of conversation you know, would be wonderful in your pregame. But even before you get to check-ins, you know, walk up to the coach, hey, coach, how things going today? You doing well? Man, great weather. Or man, cold out here. Or man, it's hot out here. Whatever it is. Talk about the weather or something like that. You know, and just go over, hey, man, it's 40-minute halves, 10-minute half time, unlimited substitutions at the referee's discretion. Sound good? Cool. Whatever. I mean, it just, it builds a little rapport. You, you get to know each other a little bit before the match. It just sets the right tone. They know that you know what's going on. Always recommend a little pre-match dialogue with coaches. But this particular coach, I've, I've worked with him before. Wonderful man. But oh my gosh. Like he was sharing with me that over the previous two years, he lost his wife to cancer, his mother to cancer, and his stepfather in just the last two years years. The last two years, lost his wife, his mother, and his stepfather, three most important people in his life. And soccer, the love of the game and the love of the kids he was coaching and the club that he was a part of is what helped him get through it all. And I can tell you, man, you can feel from this man how great, grateful he was 
for the opportunity to be on the pitch the day that day with his kids. And his kids played with that same joy and love and respect. Oh, so valued and appreciated that moment. But having that connection before the match, you know we're going to have a great relationship during the match. And you know all is going to be good no matter what happens after the match. Invest a little bit of time and get to know your coaches, refs. It pays dividends. All right, guys, we're going to move to the mailbag now. I had quite an interesting mailbag this week. Uh, So I think it was on Monday of this week or maybe Sunday of this week, I posted uh, a, a TikTok and a video that I had done actually for a club. Actually, they had bought a bulk order of like 25 coins. And I was like, hey, man, can I do something special for your club? And he asked me to do a video um, to direct it to the parents of the club, (laughs) which I was like, sure. And one for the referees as well and some other stuff. But, you know, I did it. I was thrilled. But I asked him, I was like, hey, can I share this on my TikTok? And so literally the title of the video is Dear Parents, Please Shut Up. And if you've listened to my podcast for a long time, it was very similar messaging there. But I got a lot of emails and direct messages and comments on my TikTok from people who were um, not too thrilled about the sentiment of that. So I got this message and I'm going to uh, read it to you now. So just bear in mind, like I don't mind people coming to me, you know, upset. Um, And this person was very respectful in their tone, but they were expressing themselves. So I love that. I, I, I consider it to be a good thing. So You know, he writes, hey, you know, I'm an avid viewer of the TikTok channel and I've learned a tremendous amount uh, about the rules of the game. I thought I knew the rules after playing and watching, but, you know, you've really helped me better appreciate my son's games. But he did say, I take issue with your TikTok entitled Dear Parents. He agrees that the spectators on the sideline should refrain from directly criticizing the refs, but he also feels that the parents should be able to freely express their displeasure with calls or non-calls, especially when refs are not in the correct position or miss obvious calls, in his opinion, at his son's games, which I don't know how he wouldn't be unbiased. So he goes ahead and he goes, he, he's like, I can speak to two such examples in recent games, and I don't want to add emotion to this, but he writes, first, a game where there was a single ref for a freshman high school game. He was obviously not in shape and rarely moved from the center due to his lack of physical ability. He missed an obvious handball in the box in the last five minutes that could have made a 1-0 game a 1-1 tie. Okay, I'm going to just stop right there. A single ref for a freshman high school game. Uh, Yeah, man. There's barely enough refs to cover the varsity games, forget about the junior varsity games, you're lucky you got to even have a freshman team with a referee that showed up. <laughs> I mean, seriously, the fact that he's not in shape, rarely moved around the field, that's why that guy's probably not doing the varsity games. Okay? My gosh. Listen, I get it. You're upset that there might have been a handball. Okay. But with a single ref or even a two-ref system, it could be very difficult to see Oh my gosh, it was a 1-0 game as opposed to a 1-1 tie in freshman soccer. Can you get some perspective? I'm assuming he gives this example because this is one of the examples where he wanted to freely express his displeasure with the the non-call at the referee. I mean, could you imagine? Like, think about that scene. It is a freshman game of soccer with a single ref doing their best on that big field, 120 yard long, you know, football fields that we have to soccer fields that we have to ref high school on. And he's all upset that in a freshman game, they did not get a handball. They think should have been given, man. I am so sorry. (laughs) Bless your heart. (laughs) Oh my gosh. The second one, clear breakaway of an offensive player where goalie came outside of goal box with studs up slide tackle that injured the offensive player. It was a reckless play and a dog. So both refs did not call it. I, I, I mean, again, I don't know, man. I didn't see the video. I have no idea, you know, but it's, you know, for him, he's like, again, uh, he mentions if you're asking that the The parents respect the refs. We expect competency, effort, and a bit of concern for safety in our refs. And I would gladly become a ref if it wasn't such a difficult process in my state. 
I, I, you guys are going to have to email me. Is it really so difficult in your state to become a high school ref? I think pretty much, pretty simple test, pretty simple fitness requirements to become a high school ref. I, I don't know that it's that difficult, but, um, you know, but again, the, the sentiment of the email is, you know, well, you know, if the refs are not confident, then I'm going to freely express my displeasure. So it, it just, it's a little funny. I wrote back and I said, hey, you know, thank you so much for your comments. I appreciate support. I hope you've learned so much. Uh, you know, got a better understanding of the game for my channel. And I specifically said, school sporting events are supposed to be an extension of the classroom. Do you march into your kid's classroom and scream at teachers because you do not like how they teach? Seriously, is that what this guy does? You want to voice your displeasure, you know, in public at a teacher? You're going to do that as a to the ref? Why is that different? Where else in society, and as I continue to write, where else in society do you publicly express your displeasure, meaning yell and criticize people at their job that don't work for you. Do you walk into other businesses and criticize your work? Do you yell at the postman if you didn't like what time they delivered your mail? Are you the kind of person who yells at the checkout person at a fast food restaurant if they don't like you don't like how their burger was cooked? I mean, seriously, it's not the same thing as, hey, I'm sorry, I think I might have got the wrong order. But usually what I see is people yelling and screaming and insulting people at a soccer game. So why is that any different? Why are, why are referees any less of a human being? Why do they deserve any less respect and appreciation for doing their job? Why? I mean, it's crazy. I, and I went on to tell him, it's like, you know, the example of the freshman game is like, you know, it's so interesting. You know, in my state, we have 6,800 games to cover in a high school season and only 340 certified refs. At any given time, only about 250 of those or the 275 are even fit, meaning not injured, since they also ref matches on the weekends or cover other sports as well. And by the way, we also have full-time jobs and high school requires additional certifications, expenses, kind of what that guy was alluding to. It's too difficult in my state. Games require you to be at the field sometime, like 4.30 p.m. or 5 p.m. It's got its own different rule book. Many of the top referees I know avoid it like the plague. Therefore, freshman games are going to be covered, if at all, by the least qualified and physically able people. Now, I've done a freshman game here and there, but usually it's because it's like a last-minute thing they need me to do because someone else dropped out due to injury. Generally, the level of competition dictates the level of ref you're going to get. Go watch an MLS Next Academy game and you're going to see the top referees out there, generally speaking. I also went on to say, you know, as a fellow father who has lived through sitting on the sidelines watching hundreds, if not thousands of matches, I feel his pain. I have seen many matches with what I would objectively say subpar refereeing. And sometimes it may influence the outcome of a match. Sometimes someone got hurt. But my screaming about it would not change anything or make the situation better. Almost always for every missed call, there were always 20 or more missed shots or patches, passes that could have resulted in a goal. Blaming the loss on a single decision by a referee encourages a victim mentality and prevents people from taking personal responsibility for the outcome. Think about that guy's example. Okay, freshman game. So I think we're playing 30-minute halves. They've got 60 minutes on the clock to score a goal. 60 minutes. And they do not score a goal. And you're blaming the game on one handball, which by the way, we all know handballs are really subjective and in the high school rules need to be pretty deliberate. Okay, you're blaming the game on a handball call by a referee or non-call. When your kid's team had 60 minutes to score a goal and couldn't do so. Ridiculous. Screaming and voicing displeasure will only encourage other people to scream and voice their displeasure. Other parents, other players on the field, the coaches, this is when dangerous situations occur. This is when it goes from verbal to physical and people get attacked. So to this parent, whether they're correct in their judgment on the handball or not, they are creating a toxic environment that will lead to referee burnout and could also lead to physical violence. Words become actions. And I said, I wish you all the best.
Gerson. And now he wrote back as well. And I, I thought this was great. It's like, <laughs> he wrote, I suggest that expressing displeasure for bone calls, especially when it comes to player safety, that's always the classic, right? It's always about player safety. It's not rude as you suggest. And yes, I'm displeased. If I am displeased with how a teacher is teaching, I will voice my opinion to the school. Again, I guarantee he does it a bit more professionally than marching into their classroom and yelling at them than he does to the referees. Uh, So he says, I will not march into the classroom. As for other examples, I will express my displeasure if substandard service is received. And he writes, I love this, except for the mailman. I come from a family of mailmen. How about that? So he comes from a family of mailmen, and so he won't criticize the mailman. But he's never put on a referee jersey and been in the middle of the pitch and had to make the calls that we do. So he feels that he can yell at us. How about that? How about that? Yeah, it it was interesting. I can go on and go on about this message. I mean, again, I just, you know, I messaged him back and I just said, you know, I wish you all the best and success for you and your family. Um, But it is just, it is so upsetting when I hear people justify abuse just because we are referees and somehow we are less human and less deserving of respect from other people in society. A um, couple more things from the mailbag, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, this one uh, came in this week. This came in yesterday. Uh, someone writes, got confronted and followed to my car yesterday by some parents after a high school, after I gave a high school kid a straight red for violent conduct after he purposely stomped on an opponent's foot. That's good. So getting chased out to the parking lot. I don't know if you guys saw my TikTok and Instagram post today, but uh, last night in Michigan, a referee at the end of a high school playoff game where a team was losing 3-0, um, in the last 10 seconds, a player made about a 20-yard run over to a referee, punched him in the back of the head, and then got on top and then punched him again before he was pulled off um, in a high school match. High school soccer. And this kid is committing a felony act of violence against a referee. Oh gosh. All right. Let's do one that ends on a positive note. Um, this is a message that I got, uh, earlier this week and it says, I know you may not see this, but I had a game today where I made a bad mistake. What would you recommend doing to try and regain confidence as a ref? I love this question. Okay. First and foremost, and I've done a podcast this, be like a goldfish. You got to forget it. Yes. Learn from it. Certainly, you know, review it maybe with some other referees, you know, to get some perspective on it, to understand maybe what you could do differently next time. But you cannot let it define you. You have to continue to look forward. When I'm on the field and I feel maybe I missed that call, maybe, man, man, did I get that right? I'm constantly saying to myself, okay, next call, next call, dial in. The next 10 minutes, you're going to be great. The next 10 minutes, you're going to be great. And we've got to go ahead and look forward. Got to make sure that we stay present. It's that classic Kung Fu Panda boat uh, quote. I'm sorry. You know, if you, uh, again, it's uh, the past is called history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. You know, stay in the present. Don't let, you know, what happened in the past take over your mind and define you always look forward. It's really important, you know, just like a great striker, you know, a great striker, an attacking player on the pitch, they've got to clear out, you know, that last play where maybe they miss hit the ball or they hit it over the bar from six yards out and be ready for that next play so they can score that winning goal. It's the same thing for us. We've got to forgive ourselves. If maybe we've made a mistake, it's okay. It happens. Even professionals make mistakes as we started this podcast. It's okay. Everyone makes mistakes. Every player on the pitch is going to miss a shot. They're going to miss a pass. They're going to miss a tackle. Okay, It happens. We are on the pitch too in the moment. Sometimes we're going to make a mistake and it's okay. Learn from it and look forward and give yourself grace that even the professionals make mistakes too. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's pod. Life as a referee is always unpredictable. You never know what to expect in every match. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like it so much. So guys, if you like the show and my content, please, please, please consider supporting me by purchasing some Mitch, some merch um, from refsneedlove2.com. I don't know who Mitch is, but merch from refsneedlove2.com or TikTok or Insta, whatever. The pod, the website, 
everything else I do has a cost beyond just my time. Purchases from the store help me cover the cost of doing this. I want to wish you the absolute very best of luck on the pitch, and I hope your next game is red card free.